All right, now that we've had a time to prepare our hearts for worship, I trust that you'll sing just as loudly and strongly as you did while the prelude was being played. So <laughs> let's stand together and let's worship, all right? He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all blessed be he. with us this morning. For those of you who may not know who we are, I'm Roger Kenyon, Paul George, uh, we're your pastors and uh, we're glad to have you worshiping with us. First Sunday of every month, uh, we celebrate communion together and even though it may be Labor Day weekend, we're still following that tradition. So we are going to be doing communion together this morning. It's our practice here at Calvary to invite all who are believers. If you know Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, we invite you to uh, uh, Join us this morning in this time of remembrance as we remember all that Christ did for us on the cross. I'm going to read to us to start with out of Luke chapter 22. Uh, as, as the, the uh, Lord's Supper, the, the Passover that the disciples were celebrating with Jesus. This is how it's recorded, starting in verse 14. It says, when the hour came, 
he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup. After giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We celebrate communion symbolically. Recognizing the bread that represents the body of Christ. Not physically the same element, but symbolically the body. The life he lived, the sacrifices he made. The sufferings he endured for us. But also the love and the example of love that he set and showed. The cup. We use juice. Symbolic of the blood of Christ. Referred to as the new covenant of grace. For without the blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sins. And Jesus became that for us. And so as we take this together, it's this time of remembrance. As the Apostle Paul encourages us, we need to always uh, start with making sure we're right with the Lord before we take communion. Because communion is a commitment and a recommitment to our following of Jesus Christ as disciples, doing things His way. And so we should confess our sins, make sure we're right and righteous before the Lord through the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. So I'm going to take a few moments and I'm going to lead you in prayer. I encourage you to pray privately and just seek the Lord on your own. If there's any unconfessed sin, this is a time to confess it. Just your heart to His. Seeking His forgiveness and restoration. Then uh, we'll conclude the time of prayer. And the deacons will make their way forward. And we'll share together in communion. We'll give you more instructions at that time. Join me as we pray. Father God, we thank You this morning. That we can come before you as your children. With your name. As our name. Beloved. To our father. Lord we know that we are not perfect. That even though in salvation you have washed away our sins. And you've given us new life. And life eternal. We've not lived it out perfectly. And Lord sometimes we even forget. Or neglect. The need to say, I'm sorry. Forgive me, for I've wronged you. So we come to you now. Asking you to reveal to our hearts any unconfessed sin. And as we confess it, asking you to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Asking you to cleanse us and make us pure and holy. Though we come repentant. Asking you to replace our sin nature with the nature of Christ. That we could be more like you. Less like our old selves. Help us each day. Each hour. Each moment. To be more like you. Forgive us where we fail you. And restore us to righteousness. Then as we celebrate this time of communion, this time of remembrance, fill our hearts with joy and gladness because you have found us worthy, not of our own, but through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, help our hearts to be committed to take this, this time of communion, and to be refreshed and renewed as we remember you and as we commit to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Deacons, if you'll come.
in the trays, you'll find a stacked set of cups. Each person that's going to receive communion with this morning, grab one set of those cups. And just hold on to it until the deacons have served everybody and make their way back to the front. If you separate your cups on the bottom, you'll find the bread. As Jesus passed the bread and they each took it, he said, this is my body that's given for you. Paul's going to lead us in prayer. At the end of the prayer, we'll take it together. Lord Jesus, this piece of bread that we hold in our hands represents your broken body reminds me that you were broken for me I'm broken I'm in need of cleansing forgiveness and grace and mercy without what you did on Calvary's cross we would be lost hopeless there would be no salvation there would be no forgiveness of sin we'd be eternally damned because of your great love, we can come before you today and celebrate with this gift, gift of life, Jesus Christ living in us. As we take this together, Lord, we were mindful that you've come to redeem that which was lost, you've brought back, and we are yours. Think to the cross of Jesus because that's where you sacrificed for us but we also have the great hope of the resurrection because we know that you didn't stay in the grave that you live forever and you ask me how I know you live because you live in my heart thanks in Jesus name Amen. Lord we do this in remembrance of you Bread representing his body. His life he lived before us. And the sacrifices he made in death for us. The cup holds the juice. Representative of his blood. The sacrifice that one man made for all time. For all who will believe. To reconcile the lost. To a loving father. We take the cup. We should remember. Remember. All that, that means. No longer under the law. But now saved by grace. For eternity in heaven. With our Father. Paul lead us in prayer. Oh the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh how we 
thank you. He said, this do in remembrance of me.
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus So every dark condition starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is Shadows burn like a fire. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. 
Shout it out. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Aren't you glad that blood never loses its power? The blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on children pre-k through second grade right Shirley Miss Shirley's got the back to receive you church we're going to be back in the book of Romans I'm going to finish last week's sermon actually I'm not going to finish it I'm going to get to the next step in last week's sermon you know some preachers we got we got these grand visions of how much we can get done in an hour we never quite make it so we at least in my thing I, I do part of it one week and I end up doing part of it the next and 
Well, you'll have part of it next week again. So uh, we're going to do it in three parts instead of one. So we're going to be in chapter 14, Romans chapter 14 this morning. Last week we were, began looking at chapter, into, uh, starting in verse 8 in chapter 13, at the love of God. In the book of John, Jesus says, I give you a new command to love one another. And we kind of looked at that as given to us out of the 13th chapter of Romans here. When he says, don't know anyone anything except to love one another. He says, uh, uh, emphasizes love your neighbor as yourself. He says, love is the fulfillment of the law. He talks to us about making sure that we're walking in that love and not in the evil of this world. And I mentioned last week that I thought the chapter mark probably is not where I would have put it. You know that the outside of the Gospels and the book of Acts, which are, which are history books, pretty much the rest of the New Testament are letters. And when you write a letter, it flows. It's supposed to flow. And you read through the letter. Now to help us study and to know where we are and those kind of things, we've over the years we've added chapters and verses and that kind of thing. And sometimes I think if we stick so strictly to the chapter numbers, we miss that flow that God has given us in these letters. So here's your homework, if you weren't with us last week, to go back and read just these, these few chapters here together as a letter. Not as chapters, not as verses, but as a letter from God to his people. From the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. Now we are going to pick up in verse 1 of chapter 14 today. And we're going to look at some application, some things that Paul gives the church to think about as they think about representing the love of God to the world. How do we love others as we love ourselves? How do we show the love of God and fulfill this new command that Jesus gave us to love one another? How do we do that? What's that look like? And Paul gives us just a few examples here in this first part of chapter 14. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. What should we do? How do we apply this idea? And so he gives us a few situations. Follow along as I read. We'll go through the first 12 verses this morning. Verse 1. Accept anyone who is weak in the faith. But don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything. While one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. And one who does not eat must not judge the one who does. Because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge one another's household servant? Before his own Lord he stands or falls. And he will stand. Because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges, judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. And whoever eats, eats for the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, and whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the living and the dead. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. It is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me. And every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. I've said for years in the church world, in the church setting, you know, sometimes we, we try to fix other people, right? Y y all have encountered that, either trying to be fixed or trying to fix somebody else. I've said for years, you have my blessing to fix somebody else. But first, you have to accomplish the great commandment. Once you do that, feel free to work on somebody else. But until then, you got work to do. What's the great commandment? 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If we really think about it, none of us are going to have time in this life to judge somebody else, are we? Because none of us are going to perfectly love God. None of us are going to perfectly love others. And far too often in the church, what the world sees is judgmentalism. And here I think the Apostle Paul is saying to the church, you're going to be known by your love. There's some things you need to make sure you're doing well. And he starts off, the very first thing is accept anyone who is weak in faith. And don't argue about disputed matters. Sometimes we expect everybody to be where we are in our faith journey. And if they're not, we either look down on them or we alienate them or we, we, we push them off. And that's not at all what God intended. In fact, the stronger brother should lift up and encourage the weaker. The one who knows more ought to teach the one who knows less. And what we will generally find is that in a group setting, three or four, maybe more, joined together... Some are going to be strong in one area and weak in another. While others are strong in that area and weak in another. And together we all grow to be more like Jesus. But we have to be able to give enough grace to say. Even though we may not be at the same spiritual level. We may not have been in the same uh, in the faith as long as each other. Somebody may be, have been a Christian for 30 years and somebody three years. We don't hold that against them. But rather we embrace them. And join them together. Shortly after I came to Calvary as pastor, we called Larry and Polly to be music minister. Larry to be music minister. And Polly came to accompany him and had, had a great time together. And when Larry retired, he stuck with us. And I want to tell you some inside story here. Two comments that were made to me. One, when we were calling Larry, was he's not a Southern Baptist. We can't have him at Calvary. Now, see, Larry came out of a Bible Baptist community. Doctrinally, I don't think there's a dime's worth of difference. Probably not even a penny's worth of difference. We were in lockstep doctrinally. And I explained to the person who said that to me, you weren't a Southern Baptist either until you joined the church. And the day you joined the church, you became a Southern Baptist. And if we call Larry, the day he joins Calvary, he'll be a Southern Baptist. And according to the Lord, the first one sent to the labor field and the last one sent to the labor field, they get the same wages, don't they? Because it's the Lord's, Lord's wages to give. And so we can't hold that against him. We shouldn't judge the longevity and we shouldn't judge the faith level. Rather, what we should say is let's all come together and all become better together. Second thing that was said was when he retired... You need to ask Larry not to attend church here because when a minister retires and stays at the church, it's nothing but division. Can anyone in here say anything about Larry? Negative. I mean, he is the most gracious, most loving, most supportive person. From the day he retired, he's picked up the, the bass guitar or the drums or some other instrument and sang in the choir and sang in the praise team and been nothing but supportive. Tune the piano every week. I mean, just great things. Sometimes we judge the motives of others because our hearts aren't pure. Don't we? We need to accept different levels, different, different things. And we need to encourage those different levels and different things. We need to come together and make the kingdom better through all these things. He also says don't judge or don't, don't focus in on disputed matters. Now this is the Apostle Paul, a Jewish man. Coming out of a Jewish tradition, synagogue and such. Writing to a church in Rome that has some Jewish church members and some pagans, some former pagans. They weren't Southern Baptists until they became believers and you know, then it all came together, right? Had nothing to do with Southern Baptists. They, they, they received Jesus and they started worshiping together in the same church. And there were some disputed matters. He's going to identify just a few of those and teach us, using these illustrations, how the church is supposed to show the love of Christ. How we're supposed to interact. How we're supposed to embrace one another and not push each other away. So what are some of the disputed matters he deals with? Here he talks about food. He talks about the day of worship. He talks about how we treat 
our servants. He says, don't get so focused in on the disputed matters. There's a lot more we have in common than we don't have in common. There's a lot more that should unite us than should divide us. We're probably never going to agree on everything 100%. I don't expect you to agree with me 100% on everything I preach and teach. Because you have the right to be wrong. Jim, you said that out loud. And I may be still learning and maturing in the process, right? And together we're going to be better. And that's okay. He says in verse 2, one person is going to believe he can eat anything. And one person's... Paul kind of violates his own teaching here, by the way. While one is weak, who is weak, only eats vegetables. He just said we're equal. Now he's calling one of them weak. He's making a point. Did you know... That back in the Garden of Eden, that Adam and Eve were vegetarians. Did you know that after Adam and Eve, all the people were vegetarians up till Noah came off the boat? It's when Noah came off the boat that God said, you can eat meat. He says, don't worry about what one person's eating and what one person's not eating. It's less important what you're eating and more important on who you're worshiping and what that means. Jesus talks about fasting and says, don't let somebody notice that you're fasting. Don't draw attention to yourself. Because it's not about whether you eat or don't eat. It's not about what you eat or what you don't eat. It's really about are you dedicating yourself to the Lord? Are you thanking the Lord for the food you've received? Are you honoring God in what you're doing? So if you choose to be a vegetarian, you know what? Bless you. That's more meat for me. And if you choose to eat meat, come on over. We'll do it together. I'm not going to judge you on that. Right now in our culture, I say the word, word vegan. What do you think? Now don't answer that because it may not be good. And guess what? you got to answer for that sin. Because it doesn't matter what you eat or don't eat. As long as you're doing it to the, for the Lord. If you're doing it for the Lord, then bless you. And be blessed. And encourage each other. Sometimes we let things like this become disputed. And become a breach in fellowship that God didn't intend. There are some other things that Paul will warn about in his letters. Like food sacrifice to idols. We shouldn't be participating in that. Because we only have one God. And we honor him in that way. So we avoid those things that are set apart for a demon. Or for a false God. But anything that God has given us permission. That he has said is permissible. We can't judge any, each other on. But rather we come together don't judge those who eat or don't eat he also says in verse 4 don't judge another's household servant now we're Calvary Baptist Church in Greenfield Indiana most of us don't have household servants by the way when God allowed the scriptures or, 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 or through the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures to be written he's not endorsing slavery or servanthood but he is commenting on the reality that it exists. And he says here, don't judge your neighbor's servants. So I'm going to change this a little bit to raising your kids. Because if you're raising them right, they are your servants. <laughs> kids don't like that. <laughs> how many times have we looked across the aisle and judged how somebody's raising their kids because they don't raise them the way you do? Well, you don't homeschool your kids. You put your kids in public school. Well, you homeschool your kids. They're not going to have social etiquette. And we look and we start judging each other, right? Well, you use spanking and I use time out. Oh, by the way, you don't use spanking. Your CPS will get called. Um, we don't want to abuse ever. We never want to. And we don't want to make light of abuse because it happens. But there's a reality that as we discipline, as we raise, as we encourage along the way, we do it different. And we want everybody to do it the way we do it, don't we? Because if we're not doing it my way, it's wrong. I, I was in a class one time. It was a, it was a corporate training class. And the lady was, was uh, uh, using an illustration to make a point. And she, she asked, how do you load the dishwasher? And she went around the room and each of us had to tell the right way to load the dishwasher. And you know, I think every one of us did it a little different. Some started with the 
silverware. Some started with the glasses. Some started with the cup. Some did it this way. Some did it that way. Now, me being the brilliant leader that I am, she got to me and she said, well, how do you load the dishes? Or, or what's the right way to lo load the dishwasher? And I said, my way. And she says, that's right. Each one of us has a different way and we expect everybody to do it our way. We had, for Elaine, we had a caregiver and she loaded some of the, some of the dishes different than I did. She'd help with the dishes. And you know what? I discovered her way worked better in some areas than my way. What he's saying here to us, you don't judge somebody else's house, but you lead your house to the very best of your ability, the way God has called you to lead it. Every child is going to be different. Every family dynamic is going to be different. And you have not walked a mile in their shoes. One of the things they teach us at seminary when you go into a crisis situation is never tell somebody, I've been exactly where you are because you haven't. Oh, your kid may have been an alcoholic and their kid may have been an alcoholic, but that doesn't mean you've experienced everything they've experienced or they've experienced everything you've experienced. Those situations are different. You've lost a loved one and they lost a loved one. It doesn't mean it's the same circumstances. Your relationships might be strained. And if the relationship is strained, then it's going to be different for that person than it was for you if you had a very close and loving relationship. But what you can say is, I'm here to walk through this journey with you. Because I know how much I hurt when I lost my loved one. And I want to be here to help you through your journey. It's different. It's not better. It's not worse. It's different. Why? Because God has a unique relationship with each and every one of us. And we're not to judge how the other one does it. You know we're Calvary Baptist Church in Greenfield. There's, you know there's a, there's a Calvary Baptist Church in Greenwood. And we do some things different. And I don't consider our way better than their way. And they don't consider their way better than our way. We're both Southern Baptists. We both love Jesus. We both do mission trips. We both get to the cooperative program. We both teach scripture. And we've agreed to partner and work together. We had our associational director with us at the 8 o'clock service this morning. He's got about 100 churches across the greater Indianapolis area. Guess what? Some of them do nothing but praise music. Some of them do nothing but hymns. Some of them read out of King James only. Andy, you can't go there. <laughs> You're stuck with Calvary. Some of them use the NIV or the ESV or, or Holman Christian Standard. It's okay. We're different. We got more in common than we have apart. And we learn and we grow together. And the scripture says that's okay. In fact, what he says... Don't judge your neighbor and their household servants. Before his own Lord, he stands and falls. And the Lord's able to make him stand. I stand before Jesus. He's my judge. And he's going to give me the ability to stand. Y'all have said to me, some of y'all have said to me, Pastor, you're too gracious. You need to be a little bit harder. I, I, I get told every once in a while, you need to preach a little more on hell. I believe in hell. And some of you go in there. Uh, I was looking at the camera, the Facebook, not those of you who are here live. I believe in hell. It's literal. But I'll tell you what, Roger's messed up just like right then. Enough times that I need grace. And I need a lot of grace. You know when Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, at the end of that, what we call the Lord's Prayer, there's a, a few more verses that says that we should forgive one another. That we should not judge one another. By the measure with which we judge, we will be judged. And when I get to heaven, I want God to look at my life and how I treated you. Say, man, you showed them a lot of grace even when they didn't deserve it. So I'm going to show you grace. Through the blood of Jesus. Even though you don't deserve it. Doesn't mean we can't ever stand on the word of God because we should always stand on the word of God. Paul's not denying that reality. The truth of God is the truth of God. But we can still show the love of Jesus. Even when we disagree. He gets into the days of the week. Verse 5. One person judges one day to be more important than another day. You know what the argument here is? Do we worship on the Jewish Sabbath. Saturday. Or do we worship in the. What we today would call the Christian Sabbath. The resurrection day on Sunday. 
you know Paul doesn't give an answer to that question? Which day is the right day to worship? He doesn't answer. In fact, he says, don't argue about it. But rather be convinced in your own mind. Do the research. Study. If you get in the scriptures and you say that you want to worship on Saturday because it honors the Old Testament tradition in six days God created on the seventh day he rested. So my day of rest is going to be the seventh day when I reflect on God and love him for all that he's done, for all that he's doing, for who he is and his character and his nature. Then so be it. You worship on, on Saturday. If you want to be like the New Testament church, this is my Savior lives and he walked out of the tomb on, on Sunday and we're going to worship on Resurrection Day because that's my new hope. Then so be it. But be convinced that that's the right thing to do. And if that's where your Holy Spirit convicted to be, then stand there, stand firm. But don't judge the others who found a different conclusion. Because the scripture is silent to that. In fact, he says all days are the same, right? In essence. But he does tell us we need to have a Sabbath every week. And we need to set that day apart. And we need to make sure that we're worshiping the Lord on that day. And that's really what's important. Are we worshiping? Are we honoring Jesus with our lives? Are we, are we doing the best we can do with what he's given us? Into verse 5. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. That doesn't mean you're always right. I've been convinced fully many times. And my wife said turn left. And I turned right. I was fully convinced I was correct. And I still ended up in the wrong place. Allow room for the Holy Spirit to work. Or your spouse. Allow room for God to work in your life. To get you where you need to be. But be convinced. But also be open if the Lord wants to improve you. Because you've not arrived. And you're not perfect. And you're still growing. And you're still maturing. And there's always going to be somebody a little further along than you are that you can learn from. And there's always going to be somebody a little further behind that you can help bring to where you are in the journey. Don't be judgmental about it. Show a lot of grace. I want to give you a general principle here. Because sometimes in churches we're not very good at this. We should humble ourselves. And let others be right. Paul says as much as possible. I will humble myself so that the gospel of Jesus Christ will not have an obstacle created by my life. Where I can, I'll let you be right. And where the scripture's clear, I'll stand firm. And church, we got to do a better job of that as we take the gospel to the world. Because far too often what the world sees is us not loving them. What they see is us not loving Jesus. And he spends a lot of time here. Saying we need to do better. We always want what we want don't we? Easiest place to see this is in the music ministry of a church. Not just Calvary. Any church. Music ministry has divided more churches I think than anything else. Maybe second to carpet color. I mean it, it, it's an amazing thing. You want to split a church. Change the color of the carpet. You want to split a church. Sing a diff different song. Some of y'all like hymns. And you get mad because somebody else likes praise songs. Everybody ought to be like me. Well, here's the news. They're not. In fact, the scripture says sing, sing a new song. It doesn't mean you can't sing the old songs. But we try to make room for everybody, don't we? We want to meet everybody where they are, at least at some level. But let me say, the more mature you are, the more you ought to be given in when it's not a violation of scripture for the benefit of a brother or sister who may be struggling. The more mature you are in the faith, the less you ought to be saying, I need to have my way. And the more you ought to be saying, how can I glorify God in this situation? He says, don't look down on the weak brother. I think we ought to be lifting the weak brother up. Those of you who love hymns, teach them to the kids. Teach them to the teenagers. Explain to them why they're so meaningful to you. And this is not the right answer. Because that's the way we've always done it. 
So what? I don't want to do it the way we've always done it. Prior to Jesus, guess what? They'd always gone to the altar with a meat sacrifice. It's the way we've always done it. Well, it's not the way we do it today. Jesus ended that. He was the sacrifice. His blood spilled. We don't have to do that anymore. We've been blessed. And we have a new opportunity. A new way to think. A new way to show the love of Jesus. It's not in the day that we worship. It's not whether your way of raising your kids is better than my way of raising my kids. It is not the songs we sing or don't sing. It is not. I know I added that one. That one wasn't found in the scripture. It is not about uh, the day of the week in which we worship. It is about this. Here's the final word. Verse 8. No, um, verse, verse 6. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God. There's an assumption there, isn't it? It's stated, but there's an assumption. That he gives thanks to God. That we're recognizing God in it. And whoever does not eat, it's for the Lord that they don't eat. There's an assumption there, isn't there? It's stated that it's for the Lord. If all that we do, we do for the Lord, then we're going to bring glory to God. But when we start wanting our way and our rights, we're not loving others the way Christ loved us. Because Jesus had all the rights. He and God are one. But yet he gave up his right to sit at the right hand of the Father. To be united with the Father in in eternity in heaven. And he took flesh upon his godly nature. And God became man in Jesus Christ. And he limited himself for us by becoming fully man. As he was still fully God. He who was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, where the, 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 those, those kind of creatures around the throne of God would worship him day and night. Now he's a babe in a manger. Now he's a child being cared for by his parents. Now he's a young man learning the trade of carpentry. Now he's an itinerant evangelist, a rabbi. But the difference is. The religious people hated him. He told his followers, I have nowhere to lay my head. So know what you're getting into and you come and follow me. He who had the authority and the right to be served became the servant of all. He's the one who put the towel around his waist and washed the feet of his disciples. He's the one who did all this for us. He set the example of giving up his rights. So that others could be blessed. Never in violation of the word of God. Never in a breach of fellowship with God. But always perfectly for the honor and glory of God. And we keep that as a, at the center of who we are and what we're doing. Then we're honoring the command that Jesus gave us. To love one another. Then we're keeping that command that he's given us. To glorify his name By his love will be known. It's when we're looking out for the best interest of others. It's hard sometimes to not get your way. I remember as a young pastor in South Carolina. um, Kind of fighting with the church as many pastors do. I've been blessed here for 17 years. I don't think I've ever had a fight with Calvary. It's been awesome. I was having a bit of a fight with some of the leadership down there. And I got upset one night. And I I said, when's it my turn to be right? You know, I was super godly back then. And humble, just like now. Some things I'm still working on. When's it my turn to be right? How many times have we asked that in our lives? Jesus didn't take his turn to be right, but rather he took his turn on the cross. He took his turn on the cross. He took, actually, he took my turn on the cross. And your turn on the cross. It's not always easy to give up that which is ours to let somebody else be right. But you know, that's our call. Here's what I've learned in life. It's not always easy, but it's always worth it. 
Guys, if you're like me, ladies, close your ears. You don't get to listen to this part. If you're like me, in your wallet, you got this bill that's kind of folded up and stuffed in the corner. The me money that your wife doesn't know about. Don't worry, she's not listening. It's okay. And you're saving that money for that new whatever it is that you want. Whether you want to go play golf with Jim or you want to go shoot around uh, at Highsmith and, you know, the ammo is expensive. Or whether you're waiting to buy your next gadget. Let's watch them at Jiggers. They, they, they cost a lot. So you, you fold it up, you stick it in the corner of your wallet, and you hope she doesn't find it. But if you guys are like me, almost every time you got the right amount of money to do what you want to do, one of your kids needs a new pair of shoes. And you don't know where you're going to get the money from. And you remember, I've got it folded up in my wallet. What do you do with that money? You save it for yourself? No, you don't. You pull it out and, you know, that, that $200 pair of shoes? You buy it with a smile on your face. Okay, I buy $20 pairs of shoes. but <laughs> With a smile on your face. Knowing you gave up something you were saving for and you really wanted. But you are more fulfilled because you took care of your family. Am I not right, guys? We've been there and done that. And you never miss that which you sacrificed to do the right thing. Because there's a fulfillment that comes when you honor the Lord of Lords. It's all academic until you walk through those doors into the mission field, into a difficult environment. And you want to be right. And you want to be seen as right. And you want to be honored as right. But you know the right thing to do. Because it's not a biblical issue. Or it's not a, 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 it's something that's, that's opposed to the will of God. The right thing to do is to sit down and shut up. And throw your arms out. And just love on that individual. You know you may have a better way of doing it. You might. You know you can teach them that way over time. A lot easier than if you just fuss at them and say, you got to do it my way right now without any explanation. I think for too many years, churches have yelled at each other instead of talk to each other. I think for too many years, congregations have wanted it their way instead of wanting it God's way. I think for too many years, in our own personal lives, We've said, God, honor me where I am. Rather than, God, change me to be more like you. I think that's what Paul's writing to. Writing about. Church in Rome. They're split. You got some traditionalists. And you got some people who yesterday were part of a pagan religion. That sacrificed babies and had temple prostitutes. But then they met Jesus and their hearts and lives were changed. That traditional Jewish part of the congregation wants everybody to be traditional and Jewish. This new Roman part of the congregation, they want a new song. And they're fussing and fighting. And Paul says, guys, get over it. I don't care if you meet on Saturday or Sunday. I don't care if you use the old hymn book or the new praise course. I don't care if you raise your kid in public school or your home school. Here's what I care about. Let's honor Jesus. Because what you've committed in your heart to the Lord, that will be blessed. So be convinced in your own mind, you're doing it the right way. One last thing. How do you get convinced in your own mind you're doing it the right way? You ought to be asking me that question. Scripture says that's what, that's what we ought to do. End of verse, verse 7. Let each one, end of verse 5 rather, let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Well, how do you become fully convinced in your own mind? This is a quickie. I'm not going to keep you much longer. We're almost done. Then I'm going to ask you to respond to the Lord. You read the Bible because it is God's holy word. It is without error and it is our guide for life. Old Testament and New Testament. You read it. If you never read it, start. 
You don't have to read it a whole thing by tomorrow, but you can read a bit in peace each and every day. And you can learn and you can grow. And before long, you will have read it all if you take the time and energy to do it. Many of us do it once a year. We start and we go through the year just a chunk at a time. 10, 15 minutes every day. By the end of the year, you've read the whole thing. It's an awesome thing. You're never going to know the will of God if you don't know the word of God. Read the Bible. How, do you, how are you going to become convinced in your own mind in alignment with Jesus if you never read the book he left us? Pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. Pray, meditate on the word of God. Don't just give him a laundry list of the things you need and want. In fact, I would encourage you to start with, Lord, you're holy, just speak to me. And just quiet your heart and let him work. He'll begin to bring things to your mind, teach you things in the silence. He won't leave you empty. He will fill that time. But set it apart, set it aside, have a time of prayer. If you want to do the will of God, you've got to spend time with God. And you need to know His Word. That's how you become convinced in your own mind. But let's don't forget the third rung of this stool. We were built to be in fellowship with other believers. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We need to be doing this in partnership. We need to be doing this together as a body of believers. We don't stand alone. Alone, We stand together. Matthew uh, chapter, I think it's 18. He says, for two or three are gathered together, there I will be also. You know what he's talking about in that passage? He's talking about church discipline. When a brother has wronged you, what do you do to, to restore him? How do you bring about restoration? Will you seek the Spirit of God and unity of mindset... And so you gather with two or three brothers in prayer. And there God will reveal the truth that you need. Because one of you may see it one way. And another one may see it another way. And the third one's going to bring wisdom to the situation. And if you pray together, you'll come together. And we got to do more of this. Becoming convinced in our own minds. Not for separation, but for unity. Allowing each one to be unique in who God's created you to be. But also to be a part of the family. One body, many parts. I wonder this morning. Are you honoring the Lord with your life? And how you love other people? Or have you been a little more on the judgmental side? Not accepting the weaker brother or sister. And what do you need to do to make it right? For some of you, that starts with knowing Jesus. Because you can't be like Jesus if you don't know Jesus. Scripture says that if you'll believe that Jesus is God's son, they died on the cross for your sins and rose from the third day, and you ask God to forgive you your sins, that through the blood of Jesus you will be forgiven. When you confess him as Lord, he says, Jesus will confess you before the Father. You'll be saved. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You will be saved. Because you can't be like him without him. So first and foremost, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, will you make him that today? Will you receive him? He's offering to pay the sin debt that you owe. If you'll receive him. If you're in Christ Jesus, are you loving others the way God has loved you? Putting others before yourself? Finding peace, not division? Finding agreement, not controversy. See, God's called us to unity in the Spirit. That doesn't mean we agree on everything 100%. But it does mean that we agree that God comes first. And that we honor Him through Christ. And that's a daily walk issue. This is where the rubber meets the road at the workplace. At the bus stop. Wherever you may be. Are you loving God? The way he loved you while you were still a sinner. If not, maybe you need to confess, repent, and be restored. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a moment. But before that, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for a passage 
that draws us together in unity. By pointing out the things that separate. And by pointing out the foolishness of the things that we allow to separate. Oh, there, we, we know there are absolutely some things we do not compromise on. We do not let up on. Salvation only comes in the name of Jesus. That we have to confess our sins. And repent and live in righteousness to the best of our ability. That we need to be seeking you daily and improving ourselves. But Lord, so often we get so focused on the other things that we miss the main things. So we come to you today with the most important thing first. But we ask that you would save. Bring salvation to those who do not know you. As your word has said, if they will believe that Jesus is your son and he died on the cross for their sins. And if they will confess him as Lord of their lives, that they will be saved. And Lord, we ask that you do a work of salvation in the life of anyone who has not yet received you. Make them a new child of God. Give them the name that is above every name. Give them your name. Father, give them new life. Father, for those of us who know you, who have been given new life, help us to live like you. Not seeking our own will, but seeking your will. Not seeking our best, but seeking your kingdom's best. Being able to pray as John the Baptist prayed, Lord, I must decrease so that you may increase. Not my will be done, but your will as Jesus prayed in the garden. Father, help us to make sure that we are seeking out the best of those around us. And not just our best. Forgive us where we fail you in this. Restore us to righteousness. And allow us to worship you. Now Lord, during this time of invitation. We ask that you would allow us to respond to you. And give you all the glory for it. Whether it is saved souls or repentant hearts. Lord may you be glorified this morning. As we respond. For your glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Church will you stand with me. We have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to you this morning. You need to respond. I'll be at the altar to receive you. What is it. That God has asked from you this morning. Let's sing. Thank you.
got to find my right paper real quick. It's in the book of Luke. Where's my paper? There it is. Some of these are downstairs. They're half sheets. They are announcements that Carla puts out each week. And we have several this morning for you. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Um, but if I hope there's enough downstairs for you to grab some on your way out. Um, this coming Saturday, 5 to 9 p.m., September 10th. There is a game night at church, like board game type things. So I'm not sure what all is going to be going on, but it's listed here in the bulletin. So if you grab one, you'll have that information. Uh, hosted by our men's ministry, who also cooks for us on a regular basis on Sunday evenings. So if you're not coming to Sunday evenings, you're missing out. By the way, cooking is next Sunday at 5 o'clock, right, or something. Are we doing that? So uh, we'll get, tell you what that is next week. September 25th, we are honoring Jody's retirement after 28 years as our daycare director as a staff member of Calvary Baptist Church. 28 years of service to the Lord here at Calvary. And so we are so thankful for that and we want to honor that service. So we are going to have a service of celebration. Uh, we are going to meet for Sunday school at 915, just like we always do. We're going to have a worship service at 1030. For you guys, that's not much of a change. But for the 8 o'clock crowd, they get to sleep in an extra hour. And then, the, and then come for Sunday school, stay for 1030 service. And we're going to have lunch together. And I don't think it's going to be chicken. So I've got to talk to somebody about that. The holy bird. Um, we're going to have lunch together from 12 to whenever, one-ish. And then from 1 to 3, we'll have an open house so people can greet Jody. And we're encouraging you to share this information with the community. If you know somebody who's attended Noah's Ark or Calvary in the past, we want to invite them to come from that 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock hour. I mean, they're always welcome to come to worship services. We love to have a full house. By the way, I expect to have a full house that week. And if you're not comfortable with a full house, then maybe you can watch it on Facebook in the youth room or the community room or something like that. And you can spread out and space out. But we want you to be here. We want to honor Jody with a full house. She's, she's given a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to Calvary, to the church, to the kids of this community for 28 years. And so we want to honor her in that. Um, but we want to do it as a worship service. We honor her, but we glorify God. Because Noah's Ark is dedicated to the Lord. It's training children and training families for the glory of God. That's what we're here to do. And she's done it well. And so we want to honor her in that. So come help us celebrate well on the 25th. That is not a day off. That is a day to honor the Lord as we honor her service. September 11th, CIA begins with a bowling night at 6 o'clock. So the kids are going to sign up and go bowling. So make sure you're here on time. Information's in the bulletin about that. There's a drama ministry about to start. We're going to be working on something, I think, for Christmas. Is that right? So when Jan asks you if you'll participate, the answer is yes. You need to be praying, Lord, help me say yes to Jan. And she needs help. There's going to be a lot of people in this. And somebody said, well, if they're going to have so many people in it, who's going to watch it? It doesn't matter who watches it. It's about the fellowship of doing it together. Facebook people will watch it, right? So we're going to do it. And we're going to love it. And we're going to enjoy it. So say yes to Jan. She needs encouragement. She's sad. Her pillow's wet every night. You got to say yes to Jan. How'd that work? I said yes to Jan without hesitation. And I really don't want to. <laughs> but I love Jan. So I'm going to say yes. Um, Paul's got a quick announcement. And then I got a, just a, a couple of prayer updates for you. I got Go ahead. So, uh. I want to uh, face the challenge of how to best minister to special needs. I have the privilege of being able to special needs pastor. Uh, he's going to be here at 7 o'clock this Tuesday. Now already on the email list for that uh, email. See me or call Carla. Uh, if you didn't get an email the end of this week, you're not on that list. So the email's already gone out. So if you want to be a part of this, please let us know. We're not trying to exclude you. We just didn't do it as a general general email. We did it kind of specifically to those we know are already working with the kids. So my mic's going in and out. It's on. Now. You're good. Um, the second thing is I'm not giving up on you. <laughs> and that is my goal is to retrain you on how to approach worship. Mm. Uh, we are blessed to have some awesome musicians among us. And uh, let me just tell you about Layla a little bit. <laughs> After uh, going go this to school way. all week and then band practice every night and oftentimes going to band competitions on Saturday, she still found 
time to practice and prepare um, the prelude with her daddy. How, what, how awesome is that? Daddy and daughter at the piano on a piano duet. And so uh, my goal is that when you hear the music begin, I, I love the chatter. I love the awesome fellowship that's going on. But when you hear the music begin, to, uh, at the, that means worship has begun. And you will benefit greatly if you just take a few moments, set aside just to focus your attention on God and Jesus Christ, your, your Savior, as we open in worship, to prepare your heart to worship so that you'll give your all. Because if we just come and give half or, or just, you know, if we don't come to participate, what have we, why have we come? Uh, so let me encourage you next week. In fact, uh, let me encourage you even at the close of this service. Because if you didn't hear it at the beginning, you have a chance to hear it again. As we close the service. So maybe you can hold your chatter to get beyond those doors if you have to run out of here. But. You might benefit from just reflecting on what's been said here today, what the preacher has, has mentioned, what the Word of God has spoken to you. And just give some time for that to soak in as you leave today. When we leave this place, we enter the mission field. We want our hearts prepared and ready to go and to do and to serve. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we have our regular uh, prayer time. I know this is a, a, a holiday weekend. I am thankful we got a great attendance this, the, today. Um, but uh, we will be back tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll have prayer time. Uh, we'll probably be in the community room. Um, if it's not raining, we may go outside. So bring your lawn chair. Because I think the weather's going to be good tonight. And sometimes it's nice to be able to do it outside. So bring your lawn chair. We may do that tonight. If it's weather's not good, we'll do it in the community room. You also have youth group. Our children's ministry doesn't kick off again until next week. So they're welcome to come to the prayer time. They're, they're invited. They can be here. We love kids. And that's fine. So come back tonight. Um, let me close this. Oh, I need to give you a couple of prayer updates. Betty Kramer had reverse shoulder, shoulder surgery this week. The surgery went well. She's in intense rehab in the community network. I'm not sure which location, but keep Betty in your prayers. And uh, as she heals and recovers from that. And after our 8 o'clock service, Jenny Redmond went to Methodist Hospital to be with her mother, whose kidneys have completely failed now, and they expect only hours before she goes to be with the Lord. But here's the blessing. After the communion... At the 8 o'clock service, Scott came and talked to me in the pew and said it was just not that long ago that he had the privilege or they had the privilege of leading Jenny's mom to Christ. She's a believer. She's going to heaven. And so we know where she's going, and that's better. But we also know how hard it is to let a loved one go. And so we need to keep Jenny and her family in prayers. And they asked if they could take communion uh, to her mother today. Um, it, she's still alert and still interacting with them, but they expect her to go quickly. So keep the family in your prayers. Um, last thing, and then prayer. Uh, every Sunday we have communion. We also do Deacon Benevolence Fund. So uh, Kevin Lobbs at the back to receive that as you go. But here's what we're doing this week and next week, two weeks in a row. Uh, whatever's received is going to the Kenneth Butler Soup Kitchen. They have uh, additional um, people in need, and prices have gone up. And so they need some funding. And so they've asked the community to step up. They're having a match day the end of this month. So everything that comes in today and next week, we're going to send to them on match day. And try to get the best and the most for those who are in need and hungry and, and serve them that way. And so that, that this week, and I know some of you may not be prepared to give and will want to give to the soup kitchen. We've always given to the soup kitchen through the Deacon Benevolence Fund from time to time. And it's been a long time since we've done it. Kenneth. Um, Butler and his wife Peggy were both members of Calvary that soup kitchen is named after them and the ministry they gave to the community it's always been close to our hearts so we look forward to supporting them but that's what we're doing this week and next week with the Deacon Benevolence Fund uh, join me as I pray I'm going to dismiss us with prayer I'll greet you downstairs by the front door as you go remember I leave, the, leave this place contemplating considering Lord how can I worship you as I serve the community as I come and go Father we love you and we thank you for the call to love others just as you've loved us. We thank you for the examples you've given us. Of how to make. Uh, um, build relationships with other people. Seeing. Your best in them. Father we ask that you would. Be with those who are sick and hurting. Those who need healing. So many on our prayer lists. But Father the greatest need we have. Is that of salvation. And we give you thanks this morning. That Jenny's mom knows Jesus. 
that she will see him face to face, maybe before we do. But we give you glory and honor for that. And we ask that you would bless Jenny and her family as they gather around that bed. As they release her into your arms. Trusting that you will do as you have promised. To receive her unto yourself. And to give her that place that you prepared for her. Father, as we leave this place. Use each of us to be an encouragement to others. To love others as you first loved us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.